Hi, I'm Katie Kavanagh, one of the archivists at Aberdeen City and Aberdeen Archives. We run a joint service for Aberdeenshire and Aberdeen City Councils, and today I'm going to be running through the highlights of our Aberdeenshire collections. So our Aberdeenshire collections cover lots of local government bodies, from the present council to the Grampian Regional Council, Aberdeen, Banff and Kincardine County Councils, and going back even further, 19 borough councils across the North East, the earlier earliest of which was formed in the 12th century. Records for the County Commissioners of Supply also date back to the 17th century, so they're fairly old too. And we also have records for the parish-based school and poor relief authorities in the 19th century and into the 20th century. And for hundreds of schools that operated across the North East from the 1870s onwards. We also take in records from other organisations and businesses across Aberdeenshire. The oldest record in Aberdeenshire's Council's collections is this charter from King Robert II of Scotland to the Borough of Banff. The King's seal is attached to the charter at the bottom. This made Banff a royal borough and granted rights to the borough relating to land and trade. So it's a very important foundational document. One of our most popular collections is that of the Poor Relief Authorities. From 1845 to 1930, poor relief in Scotland was administered by city parish bodies. Poor relief records, minute books and registers of the poor have survived for the majority of parishes in the current Aberdeenshire area, giving us a rich genealogical and social history resource about poverty in Victorian and Edwardian Aberdeenshire. This example shows what a rich resource they can be. This little girl, Elspeth Jane Nidry, was born in Peterhead in 1907. This photo photograph of her was taken around 1911, when she was just three or four years old. On the 21st of October 1909, tragedy st struck her family when uh, her father, Alexander, was killed in Yarmouth, leading to her mother Sarah's poverty and subsequent debilitating ill health. This led to the family, including Elspeth and her siblings, being transferred to the poorhouse. At this point, the parish council must have realised there was a good chance that Sarah's health wasn't going to get any better in the near future, and it had to start thinking about long-term plans for the care of her children, including young Elspeth. The poorhouse was no place for a young child, and the natural solution was for Elspeth to be sent to her aunt, Jane, who had emigrated to the US with her husband in 1904. But first the council had to get her agreement, and this is probably why the photograph was taken. And so this chapter in Elspeth's life ended with the Inspector of the Poor writing in her record, 20th of November 1912, passage paid to Boston, USA and sent to Ant, sail today on Allen Liner, Numidian. We later found out from one of her descendants that she had led a far happier life in the US until she passed away in 1983 at the age of 76, so the story has a happy ending. Our earliest records relate to the collection of ta tax. These may not sound the most interesting records, but they allow us to trace the ownership and use of land back into the mid 17th century. And they can allow you to trace the economic progress of an area over time, so they're really valuable. Our series of assessed tax rolls for the late 18th and early 19th century are a real gem, one of only two surviving series in Scotland, and they allow us to trace the impact of the Napoleonic Wars and industrialisation of the time. Our school records are one of our largest and most well used collections. We have over 850 log books and 670 admission registers for schools across the Aberdeenshire area. These collections are particularly useful for outreach and for family history. The log books give us a flavour of what education was like over the past 150 years and admission registers capture details of all the pupils who attended schools in the North East. These sometimes include unusual details like this entry at the Gordon Schools in Huntley. One unfortunate pupil, William Scott, was noted as being sent to Mars when he left the school in February 1904. This doesn't mean that he was went on an interplanetary mission, but rather that he was sent to the infamous training ship in Dundee, shown here. And thanks to our colleagues in Dundee for letting us use this image. He was to be disciplined and given a trade to keep him from the poor relief system where he grew up. If you're interested in finding out more about our Aberdeenshire school records, check out our YouTube video focused exclusively on those. 
There are lots of records about war in the collection, from the militias raised by the county in the 18th and 19th century to the world wars of the 20th century. This document is part of a list of men who joined the 4th Regiment of the Aberdeenshire Militia in 1809 at the height of the Napoleonic Wars. At this time, there was a real fear that the French might invade, and militias would have been an important element in the country's defence. The 4th Regiment's headquarters were in Fraserburgh, but as can be seen from the list, there are men who came from all over Aberdeenshire to join. The list is fascinating because it also has description of some of the men. There are different columns for complexion, hair and eye colour. The entries for complexion vary greatly from black to sallow, dark to fair. Aberdeenshire's archive collections contain a lot about the effect of the First World War on the area. This letter describes the sights and sound of airships travelling over Fraserburgh in May 1917. During the war, the port was largely occupied by the Admiralty, making it a target for German submarines. The letter writer says, it is a fairly large town of about 11,000 inhabitants. There is a fine stretch of sandy beach and on the sea, minesweepers were to be seen here and there. I know you would like to see the airships that fly backwards and forwards over our heads here almost every day. At times they fly very low and then we get a good sight of them. It is splendid to watch them and hear the noise of the machinery as they sail through the air. At a place called Lenarbo, about 15 miles from here, some four or five hundred men are employed putting these airships together. They travel at a good speed, but are not so swift as aeroplanes. I am told they are used for hunting submarines. We also have a set of lantern slides of photographs of the First World War Red Cross hospitals that were set up around Aberdeenshire. And this is a great image of um, nurses and soldiers at the hospital at Drumrossi. One of the more unique set of records we have is the Aberdeen and District Prisoner of War Bureau collection. And this has ended up with the Aberdeen County Council collection um, because the county clerk was um, played a role in the organisation. The organisation was set up by Theodora McKinnon in 1915 to provide support for prisoners of war from the North East captured in the course of the First World War. This entry relates to a corporal in the Gordon Highlanders, George Much, who attempted to escape from the German POW camps four times, eventually succeeding in 1917. Moving on to the Second World War, we have a register of incidents covering the period 1940 to 1945. This register details all the incidents in the county involving enemy air action. Um, and these have been mapped onto a Google map by the archives. And it shows the concentration of incidents around the coast. We also have a deposit of photographs and cuttings relating to the Newfoundland Overseas Forestry Unit. The unit, organised by the Ministry of Supply during the Second World War, comprised 2,000 foresters from Newfoundland who worked in camps in the Scottish Highlands felling timber for the war effort. We hold a small number of records relating to trades in Aberdeenshire boroughs. The most significant of these is the records of the Banff Incorporated Shoemakers, dating back to the 17th century. This image is from the Shoemakers Court Book, recording the signatures of members of the trade who were swearing their allegiance and assurance to Queen Anne in 1702. And you can really get a glimpse of the person from their signatures there, which makes it a lovely item. And some people could only um, sign with their initials as well. Our records also capture really interesting details about local infrastructure and services, whether it be roads, housing, public health or harbours. In the Stonehaven Borough collection, we have those, these early Jews tables, which detail how much sailors would be charged for importing or exporting different goods in the 17th and 18th centuries. The goods included spices, chocolate and sugar, all luxuries at the time, and in the case of sugar, making a direct link between Aberdeenshire and the sugar plantations of the West Indies, which would have relied on slave labour. The plan on the right shows proposals for improvements at Stonehaven Harbour by the celebrated engineer Robert Stevenson in 1812, although the improvements weren't actually carried out until 1826. We have many records relating to the establishment of the road network in the North East from the 18th century onwards. This example is plans for different options being considered by the architects Jenkins and Marr for Ballater Bridge um, and they date from 1882. We also have a poster for the trains put on for the bridge's royal opening in 1885. Minutes can capture all sorts of details um, and we have lots of minutes in our collections. 
This entry in the Fraser Brook Police Commissioner's Minutes from 1892 is concerning the unexpected consequences of the town's strict measures to try and prevent a cholera outbreak in, 18, in that year. At the time, there was a global pandemic of the disease. Um, it was particularly rampant in Germany and Russia. Fraser Brook had already been badly hit in an earlier pandemic of cholera in the 1840s, and the police commissioners had put in place various measures to prevent another outbreak. These measures included quarantining foreign ships and disinfecting vessels and crews before they were allowed into the harbour. These actions led to a complaint to the commissioners from John Hackett, which is what is noted in the minutes. He was a seaman from Glasgow and he wanted the cost of replacing the clothing that was destroyed by officials at Fraserburgh. This was presumably part of the disease control measures. The list gives the list given in the letters makes it clear that they effectively destroyed his whole his whole wardrobe. He also claims that he was prevented taking passage to Sunderland to join another ship by the loss of his clothes, and he spent all his earnings waiting for his clothes to be returned to him. And he then had to walk to the Sailors and Firemen's Union in Aberdeen to get assistance. The commissioners only gave him a pound. Now, although that's over £80 in today's money, he was claimed that the total amount of the goods that had been destroyed were three pounds, 14 shillings and sixpence. 30 years later, and the world was gripped with another pandemic. This report in the Banff County Council minutes about the spread of the Spanish flu into the county may not appear that visually interesting, but it gives astonishing detail about the start of the pandemic in the area, pinpointing it, possibly unfairly, to an individual sailor returning from the First World War to Gardenston. Records like this allowed us to work with Live Life Aberdeenshire, the Florence Nightingale Museum and Banff Academy on an award-winning touring exhibition in 2019, which you can see here. We also have a lot of building plans in our county and borough collections, and this is an example from the Peterhead collection, um, and it's a proposed cinema that was going to be built in Queen Street in Peterhead. This is an unusual item in the business collection for James Sutherland's bus company in Peterhead. And um, you can see a lovely example of the artwork on one of the letterheads um, from the collection. But this minute um, on the bottom of the screen records that at a meeting in August 1939, it was interrupted by one of its directors, George Bernie Sh Anderson, shooting a fellow director in the head and another director in the thigh. Both victims fortunately survived and Anderson was subsequently imprisoned for assault and removed from his post. But this entry is only the tip of the iceberg and its legalistic tone hides the simmering feud, corruption and false record keeping that, kept, kept, that led up to the event referred to in this minute. Another business collection we have is that of Duncan and Monroe Architects, um, which is on deposit with us from Historic Environment Scotland. Um, and the plans in that collection are wonderful. Um, this is one of the ones for um, Fivey Cottage Hospital, and you can see there's an elevation as well as the floor plans. <laughs> Given the importance of agriculture to the area, it's perhaps not surprising that we have a number of farming collections. One of these is the farm account book of William and Robert Ross of East Belty Farm in Kincardine O'Neill, and this covers the period 1683 to 1780. This is a wonderful little pocket book containing all sorts of information about crop sales, family and local events, and some interesting medicinal cures, including one for a falling sickness that involves drinking mercury during a, during a waning moon cycle. Perhaps not to be advised following nowadays. It is also the possibly the earliest evidence of the practice of feeing, which was the common arrangement for hiring farm labour um, right through to the 19th century. Every six months, feeing markets would be held with farmers hiring agricultural labourers for short term contracts. And this um, entry shows that John Mitchell um, was feed for the sum of eight pounds, six shillings and um, eight pence, along with some um, clothes. And he was to be serving from Whitsunday to Martinmas 1705. One of our other deposited collections is the records of the Royal Northern Agricultural Society, which was founded in 1843 by progressive farmers and landowners in the northeast of Scotland. This is a list of the prizes for the show held in 1883. We are also lucky to have the Grampian Police Collections at the Archive. These include records for Aberdeenshire, Banffshire and Kincardineshire constabularies, as well as the Scottish North Eastern Counties Constabulary. 
The Bampshire she collection includes a wonderful set of wanted posters kept in the police station at Dovetown, but sent out by forces around the UK. On this slide, we can see a local murder case from 1907, as well as a poster looking for the notorious murderer, Crippen. There are also more local um, cases, which are perhaps less serious. For this man, William MacDonald was known as Dafty, so he perhaps was not a master criminal. Crime and punishment also feature a lot in the borough records, as local authorities have always had some limited powers to discipline their inhabitants. Incidents described range from the odd drunken incidents to more violent occasions like this one from the Inverbervie Borough Court Book. It records how John Brown was accused in January 1709 of throwing stones at Captain Charles Strayton. He confessed that he did cast some stones at the said Charles, but he did not know if he hit him, and the reason of him casting stones at him was him pursuing him with an axe to strike him without any reason. So very um, dramatic axe attacks happening in Inverbervie in the early 18th century. The borough collections also include police court records. These courts heard minor offences, but they are often quite unexpected cases. On the left, we have the case of an errant monkey in Fraserburgh in 1882. Newspaper reports show the monkey had bitten at least seven people, and those living in the street were afraid to let their children go out in case they might be injured. And on the right, we have the case of someone drunk in charge of a steam engine in 1913 in Bankery. The final collection in our highlights reel is a collection that really illustrates the links between the city and shire and the value of having a joint service and the collection is that of the Aberdeen Harbour Board. You would think on the face of it that this would be an Aberdeen collection but it includes wonderful photographs of many harbours in Aberdeenshire as well as holiday snaps taken um, around Deeside and we think the harbour engineer probably took his um, the camera on holiday with him and that's why these have ended up in the collection. So this is um, on the left, we have Peterhead, and on the right, Fraserburgh Harbours. And then we have um, an image of Stonehaven Harbour. Obviously, there's some reconstruction work going on at one of the piers here. And this is a view down on Ballater um, on D side, which is great. Um, and you can actually see the railway line running through, I think. So if you'd like to come and view our collections, just drop us an email and you can also find more information about the collections on our website. And we're always open to new offers to grow our collections. So if you have any records you'd like to pass to us, we'd be very pleased to consider them.